with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Parents always worry about their kids, but in this COVID-19 moment, which is six months long already, well, that's on another level. Tonight, we've got some expertise on how kids are coping and what parents can do to help. Then, how might all the disruption and uncertainty of this era forge the identity and prospects of the up-and-coming generation? We'll consider that as well. It's Thursday, September 10th, and that's all tonight on The Agenda. Ontario kids have been away from their classrooms, friends, extracurricular activities, camps, and the rest of it for months now. And with the new school year beginning and no vaccine yet, it's all becoming something like a new normal. Here to help us understand the emotional toll it's taking on children and youth, we welcome in Hamilton, Ontario, Dr. Andrea Gonzalez, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at McMaster University and the lead author of the Ontario Parent Survey. In the provincial capital, Dr. Ronald Cohn, president and CEO of the Hospital for Sick Children and a professor in pediatrics and molecular genetics at the University of Toronto. And Dr. Peter Zatmary, chief of the Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative between CAMH, that's the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, Sick Kids, and the U of T. And we are delighted to welcome you three to TVO tonight for an important conversation on just how well the kids are doing. All of your institutions, of course, immediately launched big research projects to study the effects of this pandemic lockdown on kids' mental health. And so we want to get a better understanding over the next half hour or so of how much impact this is having in the life of a kid. Andrea, you, um, well, you've got the Ontario Parent Survey going. How big is it? Who's been taking it? Fill us in on some of those details, if you would. Yeah, thank you, Steve. So this was a web-based uh, crowdsourcing survey that was launched at the beginning of May until mid-June to caregivers of children ages 0 to 17, and we offered it in both uh, English and French. Um, and we ended up getting an, an amazing response, largely thanks to our partners, because this was shared widely through public health units and child and youth mental health agencies and various school boards across the province. And we ended up with over 7,000 caregivers who responded to the survey that represents over 14,000 uh, children in Ontario. And I, I don't know the demographics of this, but is that an adequate number to give you a very good understanding of the way things are out there? It's a province, after all, of 14 million people, so how do the numbers stack up? Yeah, I think, I think it does give us a good um, idea. It was a lot more than we were expecting to actually get. I think one of the sort of caveats to go along with this type of survey is because it was a crowdsourcing survey, so it was... Um, anybody who decided to fill out the survey online. It's not necessarily representative of the general population, but it still uh, represents a large number of caregivers, I think, and, and children in Ontario. Well, let's put one graphic up here and share a couple of the numbers that you got from the survey. Sheldon, I'm on the top of page two here. Graphic number one, thank you, there we go. 40% uh, of caregivers reported deterioration in their children's behavior or mood, and 32% reported needing assistance with their children's behavior and or mood during the pandemic. Uh, was there any elaboration on that, uh, Andrea? But let's start there. Yeah, so we, um, we didn't ask really specific questions about the individual child. We were asking more about were there social emotional difficulties, behavioral problems, or learning difficulties. Um, that the children had within the last six months. And then we also asked a question about really any child, uh, well, they could list any of their six children, up to six children, and whether or not the child's or children's behavior had changed uh, and mood had changed since the start of the pandemic. And 
the options were that it had improved or had stayed the same or was worse off. And it was about 40% uh, of caregivers that were indicating that there was their, their children were actually worse off since the pandemic started in terms of their behavior and mood. Dr. Ronald Cohn, I, I, I guess I should ask you off the top what I should call you because, um, you know, when you appear on TVO Kids, you're Dr. Ronnie, but this is not a TVO Kids show. So uh, should I just call you Ronald or Dr. Cohn or what do you want me to call you? Ronnie is just fine. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that, but anyway. Uh, are the findings we just heard from Andrea consistent with what you're seeing at Sick Kids? Yes, it is confirming some of our preliminary findings we have seen, and it's also in line with the Chindra Mental Health Ontario survey that has found similar numbers. And it's really pointing towards that ch children, by and large, have been the unheard voices of this pandemic, and that we need to be careful not to significantly underestimate the impact this has on children, really, of all socioeconomic uh, classes, but particularly the ones who are coming from the vulnerable living and family conditions. And we are seeing very similar results and, and, and trying to address them as much as possible. Well, and we'll pursue that in a moment. Peter, how about you? What are you seeing at your end of the thing? Um, well, I, I certainly agree with both Ronnie and uh, Andrea, and uh, I want to emphasize two points. One is a really concerning statistic is that there's an increase in suicidal ideation um, as well. And these deter this deterioration in mental health is across the board, whether we're talking about anxiety, depression, irritability, or whatever. And I'll make one other point is that there is a sub, I don't know if Andrea found this in her survey, but there is a subgroup of kids who actually have done better. In other words, their mental health is improved because they're not at school, we think. And school is a stressful environment hmm. for some kids. And while this might be a short-term relief, in the long term, I'm worried about the consequences of that uh, in terms of them being able to cope with stressful situations in general. Interesting. Okay, a couple of things I've got to follow up there. First of all, are you seeing, Peter, are you seeing families for the first time experiencing suicidal ideation or mental health issues that pre-pandemic you might not have had to deal with? So in a word, yes, although I'll qualify it that the quality of the data aren't great because we don't have pre-pandemic surveys as of yet, we should hopefully, but yes, parents and kids are reporting a uh, sort of new onset of mental health distress, including suicidal ideation. You know, bottom line is we have a mental health crisis as well as an infectious, uh, as well as an infectious disease crisis here. Hmm. Now, Andrea, let me follow up on that other angle, which is, uh, did you find that in your survey that there actually is a chunk of kids out there who are doing better because school for them is too much pressure, too much intensity, too much bullying, too much whatever. Yes, we did. We found it was about 12% of children that parents were reporting were doing, like actually doing better since the pandemic had started. And I think it's for exactly the kinds of reasons that um, Peter mentioned. And we had some open-ended questions at the end of the survey to ask parents uh, about their specific situation if they wanted to comment on it. And those were the kinds of things uh, that parents were highlighting, that kids felt more comfortable at home, that they weren't being bullied anymore. Um, but it, it's still a, a relatively small proportion. And, and similar to it, what Peter was mentioning, it, it's a concern when they do transition back, especially after having been off school for six months. So. Ronald, would you anticipate that that is only short term better? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, kids are going to have to go back to school. So is that short term better or maybe long term better? No, I think this is really a short term effect we are seeing. And if you really think about that children have been isolated for six months, it's going to it's actually going to be a challenge for all the children to get back into a routine. And even though a minority of children have done maybe better without uh, the stress in school. Just imagine if they would be isolated for months and months and months, uh, reintegration into social behavior, into interactions would be exponentially more challenging.
Hmm. Let's do a few more results here from the Ontario Parent Survey. Sheldon, uh, page three, graphic number two. Thank you. There we go. Caregivers reported high levels of concern for the following. Uh, nearly half managing their children's remote learning. Oh, yeah. Uh, more than half managing screen time which is a perpetual problem regardless of pre or post pandemic. Uh, almost half managing their child's anxiety and stress. About a third managing their child's behavior. And again, almost half maintaining household routines, organization and meals. Uh, okay, Andrea, let's, if we can dig a little deeper down into these, uh, were parents more specific about the nature of the difficulties they were having on all these different metrics? Yeah, so it didn't come out in any of the specific questionnaires other than the statistics that you showed. But again, with the open-ended questions, we were finding um, consistent themes that were emerging in terms of parents really struggling, having to all of a sudden uh, balance being a, a parent, uh, an employee in many cases, and now a teacher in terms of managing the remote learning. So that affected parents in terms of, and sometimes multiple children that they had to organize in terms of uh, the distance learning as well. So I think it was just a, a real stressor in the household in terms of trying to manage all of those things and manage routines and parents um, sort of relaxing uh, screen time rules, but feeling a lot of guilt about that. Hmm. Uh, so those were some of the consistent messages that we were seeing in, in the text responses. Peter, how strong a, a sense of the damage done to children by being out of school for so long do you think your profession currently has? <laughs> well, I think we have a real problem. I mean, there is a fair bit of literature uh, emphasizing how resilient kids are in the context of disaster. Um, but this is a unique uh, situation where the social isolation that Ronnie mentioned has gone on for a long time. We don't have a lot of experiences about that. Uh, and it does suggest that this could have long-term consequences unless we begin to repair the social isolation that the kids have experienced over the last six months or so. Can we talk, uh, Ronald, about how increased screen time is um, affecting either positively or negatively uh, children right now in the province of Ontario? What are you finding? So I think we need to first start that pre-pandemic, uh, scientists from across the world, including our own scientists from SickKids and Unity Health, have shown that screen time is already having a negative impact on children. And now I just want you to practically think it through that children, or at least some children, and even moving forward, will now sit for hours in front of the computer because they need to teach, they need to be taught, and need to learn. Mm -hmm. And if they then keep isolated from their friends, their only way to interact with them is through either social media and FaceTime or the phone. So we are dealing again with screen time. So we are now looking at a number of children who may sit in front of any type of screen for six to eight hours per day. So we are just exponentially accelerating and increasing the problem that we already had with screen time before the pandemic started. Could I get you then, Ronald, to offer the parents who are watching this some advice? Because, of course, at some point over the last few weeks, every parent had to indicate to his or her school board, uh, my kid is going to go back or my kid is not going to go back. Uh, all things being equal, if you're reasonably assured that school is a pandemically safe place to be, is there any question but that the kids should be going back? I think by and large, I would say kids should be going back to school. But it is, at the end of the day, a very individual decision. Every family has to look what their school is able to put in place in terms of the bundled uh, measures in order to uh, mitigate risk from infection as much as possible and also look at their own family situation as, as much as possible. By and large, I think if parents can get comfortable with the idea of sending their children back to school, then that should be a priority. 
But there are so many other measures that come into place here that generally recommending this without an individual approach uh, would be the wrong thing. Hmm. Andrea, we, we, we've sort of been focusing on right now uh, children missing their friends as, uh, you know, the biggest problem that they're dealing with right now. But, of course, the, the isolation during this pandemic uh, goes well beyond friends. Um, grandparents, for example, or older relatives are people or, or friends of parents, for example, uh, who might have been a part of kids' lives are, are probably not now because of the pandemic. And can you help us understand how that might be affecting young people today? Yeah, we did um, look at whether or not certain households were multi-generational households because um, we had some of that data in terms of household composition and we didn't find really any differences in terms of that. But again, with some of the text responses, a very consistent theme that was coming out was separation from family and isolation from uh, other extended family members and the impact not only on the child but on the caregivers themselves and losing all the community support so losing school and other supports in the community but also losing that contact and support from extended family members that also might provide some caregiving relief um, was a, a consistent message that came out uh, with the survey as well. So as much as kids may complain about going to visit their grandparents, they actually do miss them when they can't see them? I think so. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the, same, yeah. it's Good to the know. same with It's the same with school. They complain about school, but now they miss school. Ah, interesting. Okay. Let's, um, Sheldon, let's go to graphic three here if we can, because we're, um, we're going to show some more results from the uh, Ontario Parents Survey. Uh, this is not just on the kids, but on the, on the parents of the kids. 34% reported some loss of income. 46% reported that a household member had applied for financial help offered by the federal or provincial government. Uh, so that's a lot of people obviously covered off during the course of this pandemic. And let's go to the next one, graphic four. 57% of caregivers met the criteria for depression. 57%. And 30% of caregivers reported moderate to high levels of anxiety. Okay, let's get into this. Uh, Ronald Cohen, how does this affect children? So thank you actually for sharing and showing these data because I think it tells us that children don't live in their own isolation. They're obviously part of the whole family. And the anxiety exists all in society. And that translates to some of the anxiety within the family. I mean, you can probably imagine there's no single household uh, in Canada who hasn't been speaking about the coronavirus all the time. And then if you add on additional stresses like financial instability or potential uh, problems with going back to work, and now with the kids going back to school, we need to really look at this as the children, as part of the family, and as we try to address the anxiety levels over the next few months particularly, it is the children, but it's also their parents, and we need to support them as much as we support the children. Peter, that's very interesting, because I, I, I suspect there's a lot of people who assume that kids live in their own world and their own bubbles, the walls of which are so firm uh, you know, they're oblivious to what's going on with their parents. But this suggests that that's not the case. Do you want to weigh in on that? Oh, absolutely. The, the, the single most important factor uh, in protecting children's mental health is the mental health of their parents. And, you know, if there's uh, one thing that we, one message we could give to parents as they're making this transition is to look after themselves, to make sure that they have a plan, that they're, engaging their social supports that uh, you know whatever they can do to make sure that their mental health is okay that's going to be really important in supporting their kids well let me get you to follow up with with some of the very disturbing things we're hearing which is of course things like domestic abuse being up marital problems being up divorces being up all as a result of this sort of forced quarantining right now um, are frontline workers uh, on the lookout for these signs well, this is, the, to me, one of the great tragic ironies of this pandemic is that while we know the rates of mental health concerns have been going up and these traumatic 
events that you're talking about have also gone up. Actually, the demand for services has gone down. So mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, people are not coming for mental health services to the usual places, the family doctor or community mental health organizations or our clinics in the hospital because they're worried about, you know, the pandemic and getting ill. Now, I think that's beginning to change. I hope it's beginning to change, but there's this gap between the need and uh, getting the services, and that gap has widened uh, over the course of the pandemic. Ronald, I presume parents are watching this right now, and I wonder if you would give them some advice as to some of the behaviors that their children may be demonstrating that they should be concerned about. So I would like to start before I go into some specifics by encouraging all the parents to speak to their children openly about what might be scary for them, but even for themselves. I think the most important thing is to have open, transparent conversations and accept that these are very challenging different times and it's okay to be anxious about various aspects of the current life. I think some of the things uh, parents should probably, in terms of soft signs, looking for are what about the sleeping behavior of their children because the routine has been interrupted? What are around irritability patterns, patterns of sadness and, and, and frustrations, things that uh, are not as obvious uh, of a problem, but if they are either in isolation or together uh, uh, become apparent in your child, then I think that's the time where you really need to focus on your child, try to find out what might be going on in terms of what is your child worried about? Is it something about school? Is it something from your home? Is it about the family, the grandparents? So some of these soft signs, uh, I would ask parents to be a little bit more alert about than usual. Well, can I do a quick follow up on that? Because, and I'm really not trying to be a smart aleck here, but, but um, you know, every teenager fights with his or her parents. Every teenager gets irritable. Every teenager at some point almost everyone skips school or gets in trouble at school or makes their parents crazy about something. So how do you know what the difference is between the typical, yes, that's my teenager being a teenager versus, oh, this is something more serious and it's related to the pandemic? So obviously it's very different. There is no uh, black and white answer to this, but I do think that what parents have described to us through surveys and even in, in, in our conversations with parents is that some of the behaviors uh, have changed a little bit. So I don't think you would necessarily expect your child or your teenager to have the typical rebellion, uh, antagonistic behavior, but show other forms of uh, irritability, maybe being less patient around things that they usually have been patient with. So I think why there is no black and white answer but i think as parents you know your children and you see that something might be just a little different hmm. than it was before hmm. andrea of course it's back to school this week and next and the week after staggered starts for young people here in the province of ontario and i wonder if well, let's put it this way. It's all going to be different, right? They're going to be wearing masks, a lot of them, who never had to before. They're going to be in bubbles as never before. They're going to be further apart from their students and teachers as never before. It's all going to be really, really different. Uh, what should parents be on the lookout for in terms of behavior of their children that should uh, raise their eyebrows if necessary? Um, I think similar to what Ron was talking about, especially for the kids who parents may have thought were doing actually better. Um, but any kind of school refusal, any kind of anxiety specifically about going to school. Um, and then similar to what both Ron and Peter were saying, it needs to be an open conversation so that parents are recognizing some of these signs in terms of any anxieties that the children might be having that might not be expressed even in terms of uh, verbal uh, kind of things, but more like behaviors. So it might be disrupted sleep, it might be uh, the acting out behaviors, it might not be wanting to go to school at all. And it's, you know, parents need to be recognizing the signs, I think, and also 
just having open conversations and trying to get at what what is the underlying kind of cause of their child's behavior. Well, a lot of this has been posed as advice for parents, but uh, Ronald, maybe I can ask you to offer some advice to students here, and in doing so, I mean, here are some of the notes that we've seen from young students already. Here's uh, Anaya, age eight. Who will we play with at school? Another one. Hi, my name is Aiden. My question is, how are kids supposed to eat lunch if they are wearing masks? Haboon, age 11, asks, how safe is it to go back to school? You know, there is a concern in these questions from students because of the unprecedented nature of the school they're about to attend. Uh, how about some advice for returning students? So I encourage all the students to do what I did with my own son uh, this week and just talking about and accepting that school is going to look very different than it looked before the pandemic and that is necessary and it's okay that it looks different. And I think it's important that anything you see or experience at school is something you should speak to your parents about and have an open dialogue about this because some of this will look different. And there is maybe one point I also would like to make here. At some point, there will undoubtedly be cases in our schools. And I think it's really important that we do not start some blaming around this, have an open conversation about it, have the necessary support for teachers and students in place so that people, the children or the teachers don't feel guilty about that there's a positive case in school. That doesn't necessarily mean that the safety measures were not working. We are going to see this and we need to make sure that we protect our children and the teachers from a certain amount of guilt that undoubtedly everybody will feel, but it's okay that that will happen and we will have the public health measures in place to keep everyone as safe as possible. And the last comment I'm quickly make is, I'm trying to reassure all the children from a children's perspective, by and large, COVID-19 does not make children very, very sick. Only a very, very small number of children get really sick from this, mm -hmm. which is also reassuring for the children. Yeah, Peter, could you follow up on that? Because to be sure, there will be COVID-19 cases in schools at some point. We're not going to have perfection here. And when that happens, how should children react? Um, they should talk to their teachers um, and find out you know, what does this mean? That teachers should be very much engaged in a conversation about uh, the pandemic and um, illness. And if one of their uh, classmates gets ill, for example, you know, they should try and connect with him or her on social media or in other ways, keep the, keep the routine about school going as much as possible, send homework, et cetera. Try and normalize it as much as, as uh, possible because as Ronnie says, the severity of the illness is going to be minimal um, in, uh, in most cases. Andrea, I'd like to ask you about bullies. Bullies exploit everything to bully. And I wonder what the advice ought to be either to teachers or parents or students right now um, to make bullies just a little less powerful in what they do right now. That's a tough question. So are you specifically talking about in terms of the COVID-19 kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, I can it... totally imagine, exactly. I can totally imagine some bully uh, who might have, uh, you know, wanted to tease somebody about their weight or their skin color or whatever. Now, uh, you know, screaming epithets about, oh, you're COVID infected, this, that, or the other thing. How do we deal with that? Yeah, I think that um, teachers need to be, as with all bullying situations, very aware of these behaviors and if they're occurring um, in the playground or whatever and have conversations with uh, both the bully and the, the students about that COVID-19 really either getting it or um, testing positive or needing to be tested for it is, is not, it doesn't make that person uh, it, it's not a negative thing because it, 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 anybody could really get it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that the teachers just have to be very aware of it and have just open conversations like they would with any other circumstance. Gotcha. Peter, last question for you. If we do this well, is there any reason to believe that there won't be long-term 
adverse effects on children because of COVID-19? Uh, yes, if we do this well, uh, which to me means a coordinated national response uh, to this, a strategic response to this, uh, then I think we can be reassured that the risks will be uh, minimized uh, because kids are resilient. Um, as long as we implement and enforce the protective factors that we know can make a difference. And I would love to see all the provinces get together on this and develop a strategic plan. Amen. Can I thank doctors Andrea Gonzalez, Ronald Cohn, and Peter Zatmary for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your very expert views on this. We appreciate it so much. Stay safe. Be well. Until next time. Thank you so much Great for having be. us. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thanks. Tomorrow on the agenda. No one is a perfect figure. I'm a politician that's going to be asking people to back me for prime minister. I'm not perfect, even. I'm always trying to be ethical and to do my best. But we should look back and say people like McDonald, people like Riel, did some incredible things to build the country that I think is the greatest in the world. They also did some terrible things and were flawed and were, were people of their era. So how can we learn, not strike down? That's tomorrow on the agenda. Generations rarely get to choose what defines them. War, economic collapse, natural disasters have all interceded to shape past cohorts. It's hard to imagine that the arrival of COVID-19 isn't poised to do the same for the generation just coming up and perhaps others too. But let's put that to some folks who've been thinking about it. In Bouchette, Quebec, Joel Westheimer, University Research Chair in Democracy and Education at the University of Ottawa. In Peterborough, Ontario, Madeline Barbarian, a fourth year student at Trent University and a fellow at Future Majority, a nonpartisan organization devoted to youth and political action. And here in the provincial capital, Richard Warzel, futurist and financial analyst with his company, Future Search. And it's great to welcome you three onto TVO tonight uh, for, uh, I would suggest, an important and timely conversation. Richard, explain to us uh, off the top, if you would, how important is the society young people come of age in when it comes to shaping them and their futures? Well, if you look in, look backwards for a moment, as to look for an analogy, my parents' generation, the so-called greatest generation, lived through, my parents grew up uh, in the Depression and lived through World War II, and it changed and shaped and marked them for the rest of their lives. When my mother died, my father died first, when my mother died and we were cleaning out her apartment, we found old batteries that weren't she hadn't thrown away. We found sheets that had holes in them. We found I mean, all sorts of leftover things that she just didn't throw away, neither she nor my father. Uh, and it was very clear that it was because they had lived through such extreme times when things were hard to come by. So it, it is obvious that the circumstances in which you emerge, in which you grow, in which you develop, um, uh, affect you for the rest of your life. They pattern you, they, they put their stamp on you. And I think that that's going to happen with the current generation as well. Richard, I'm just uh, a follow up on this, if you would. I'm trying to imagine, you know, if you're in your mid 20s right now, you've lived in the aftermath of 9-11, you've experienced the Great Recession, and now here we are, the coronavirus. I mean, it's hard to imagine that that's not going to mess you up pretty badly somewhere along the way. Fair to say? Yes, I, I believe so. And particularly, I think that you're going to see it happen in a number of different areas. Socially, social distancing and having to stay away from people is going to affect how people interact interpersonally. Uh, if financially, the stress of uh, the financial stresses of 2007, 8, 9, 10, the Great Recession, um, are, have affected and continue to affect young people uh, in their ability to finance their, their educations and their ability to find uh, jobs and their ability to, to afford housing. Um, so, and the 9-11 the aspect has changed the way we look at the world. We don't feel quite as comfortable uh, with the, the outside anymore. We're not quite as easy peasy about it. So yes, I think that all of those things are going to affect um, young people on a number of different levels. 
And add to that the economic and financial consequences of COVID. And you've got uh, the makings of a major, major uh, um, impact on the younger people of today. Well, Richard, just referred to the greatest generation. We know, of course, of Gen X, Gen Z. The Atlantic magazine has just written a piece about something called Generation C for coronavirus. And let me read an excerpt of that as we set up the next part of our discussion. Kids, college students, and those in their first post-graduation jobs are also uniquely vulnerable to short-term catastrophe. Recent history tells us that the people in this group could see their careers derailed, finances shattered, and social lives upended. Predicting the future is a fool's errand, even when the world isn't weathering what looks to be an epoch-defining calamity, but in the disasters of the past lie clues that can begin to answer a question vital to the lives of millions of Americans. What will become of Generation C? They're talking about you, Madeline, as you listen to this conversation and you hear that excerpt. What's going through your head right now? Well, I'd love to call Generation C instead the future majority because that's where our name comes from. Gen Z and millennials who are just entering the workforce or in high school or university right now and experiencing these things. So uh, with our organization as a non-for-profit, non-partisan, we are focused on amplifying these voices. Uh, and I don't know if you're familiar, we're called the future majority because in Canada, we're the largest voting block right now. Mm -hmm. So we really have a position where we can make some change. You're the largest voting block, but you don't show up to vote. I would add that. <laughs> Uh, in the last two elections, actually, 55% of young people showed up to vote, and that's actually a record turnout for you. It may be a record, but I think probably 75 or 80% of seniors do. So they're, anyway, we're getting off the path here. But I, I guess back to my, my original uh, question, which is, um, I, I'm thrilled that you are as deeply invested in, you know, public service and trying to mobilize the vote and so on and so forth. That's a wonderful thing. Do you have your days where you are really waylaid by the fact that in your relatively short life, uh, this is kind of cr massive crisis number three that your generation is having to deal with? Yeah, of course. Even before the pandemic, their youth were experiencing some sort of hardship surrounding unaffordable housing, education, or a narrowing job market. And it's only gotten more precarious. That's a word I keep hearing from my peers and from myself is that there's a lot of precarity that we're dealing with. But it's also inspired a lot of movement for young people and a unity around a lot of issues that could be seen, at least especially in the states, as partisan issues. Joel, as you consider what is going to happen to what the Atlantic is calling Generation C for coronavirus? What goes through your head? I think there's three things to consider, Steve. Um, first of all, we have to remember that that uh, your generation, my generation, Richard's generation lived in a kind of uniquely a peaceful moment. I mean, we had to deal with uh, the threat of nuclear war and things like that, but we never had war on our soil. And so there is going to be a, a certain resilience, I think, a, a, as well to the generation, but it's definitely going to have an impact. And I agree with Richard um, on that. And, um, you know, the second thing is that the pandemic serves as like a, an x-ray for society. So it reveals all the fault lines that we have already in place in society, um, but they're now exaggerated and they're made visible. So we have uh, economic inequality and that comes out during the pandemic in the form of kids not having access to the internet or not having um, the, the same kind of schooling as other kids. Um, we have these fault lines and they get exaggerated and they get made visible. These were uh, problems in our society that were there before the pandemic. Um, they're ones that are here during the pandemic and if we don't do things to get rid of them, they're going to be problems that are here uh, after the pandemic. Um, so I think that when we think about uh, what the impact of this on generations is, we have to think of both those two things, but we also have the fact that uh, we remember that, and you alluded to this, Steve, uh, that for for this for young people, this is an enormously long period of time, right? If we can think back what, what eight months was in our lives at 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, it's, a, it's an enormous amount of time. And so it is going to have a major shaping impact on the way they see the world. A major shaping impact, but something that, um, I don't know, they, they can pass through, they can get over, or, or, or may be hobbled by it for the rest of their lives. How do you see it? 
I think that for a large number of youth, there's going to be a certain amount of resilience. I mean, people do bounce back from things. It's going to shape the way they see the stability in the world and other things, but they are going to move on. For others, because of um, growing inequality, and we also now see the the Black Lives Matter movement, there's there's a, a rampant amount of inequality in society, and it's been accelerating. Um, for some youth, there's going to be more damage than for others. Madeline, um, I want to take advantage of the fact that I know your dad a little bit, and I'm trying to imagine the conversations you might have with him that might go something like, listen, kid, I grew up in the height of the Cold War when there were 30,000 nuclear weapons poised at each other from the Soviet Union and the United States, and we all got through it, and everything's going to be fine. And if he says that to you, I wonder what you come back with. Is that a direct quote? Did you, did you tell you that? <laughs> um, I may be projecting a bit there, but, but uh, you know, he's around the same age as me, and, 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 uh, and, and that probably, you know, that's something that probably has occurred to him at some point. I think there's definitely an idea of um, resiliency in past generations, but I also think there's a resiliency in this generation. I also like to tackle the idea of, like, the idea that we're not political, because uh, the Samara Center for Democracy Research talked about how young people today have been more involved in talking about politics with each other and also more involved in going to protest than generations in the past. I know that Joel mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement, and I think we're realistic about our future. We, we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation right now if adulthood was easy to understand for my generation, but I also think this kind of precarity we're in breeds um, a necessity that also breeds innovation and progress. And that's an inspiring message for a lot of young people. Uh, at Future Majority, we're trying to shape that narrative and make this uh, an opportunity to move forward better, as opposed to a position of fear for our generation. Now, that's a fair point. Uh, uh, young people uh, are, are surely politically active today, but not necessarily in a partisan sense. And I guess I wonder, do, do you want, would you like to see your generation, as it winds its way through all of these challenges, would you like to see them more active in partisan politics uh, or, or just be sort of politically aware? I think that there are issues across party lines that all young people, at least that we've been speaking to, value. So the issue of access to education is huge, affordable housing, racial justice, environmental justice in our country, and then access to mental health care. These are platforms we've been discussing with young people over the past year that our organization has been working, uh, and they're completely nonpartisan. I think that's a wonderful thing about our country is that we can move forward on these issues, um, especially with the minority government where cooperation is super important uh, as a whole country as opposed to bipartisanly. Hmm. Richard, as you consider what advice you might want to offer this generation, ba based not only on your years of experience, but also your um, you know, your professional interest in sort of uh, divining where things are going, what would you say to Madeline? Well, it's almost hard to know where to start. There are so many issues on the table. First of all, on an individual basis, they're going, their biggest issue is going to be, can I find a job? Can I make a future for myself? Can I afford housing? Can I afford a family? In that area, I think the kind of advice that I would give Madeline and her cohort is you had better plan on being an entrepreneur because nobody else is going to manage your your career. You would whether you sign your own paycheck as a business owner or somebody else signs your paycheck because you work for them. You had better plan on behaving as if you worked for yourself and was con were constantly reinventing yourself. From the point of view of environmental issues. Uh, the real issue is not getting young people to be aware of the environmental concerns, but it's to get my generation aware and active in environmental concerns because we have largely sloughed it off. We have been remiss in our own responsibilities. In the economics sector, again, it's a matter of not just awareness, but also action. And it's, it's again, not so much her generation as it is the older generations that they have, uh, we have to become more active in, um, in overcoming social inequality. Uh, we have been remarkably selfish. Uh, I, earlier, I talked about the greatest generation, uh, which was my parents' generation. My generation, I've actually described as the greediest generation because we have taken well beyond what we have given back. And it is going to affect Madeline and her uh, peers and the generations before and after. So, I mean, that's kind of a lot to unload in, in one, one, one shot. But I feel that, that uh, there is, they have the resilience, they are bright, they are capable, they're interested, they are involved. 
but they've got a lot of obstacles to overcome, a lot of which we have put in their way. Madeline, what's your reaction to that advice? Uh, I think it's very good advice. Uh, we're also trying to do that with our group by legitimizing ourselves to politicians. So a lot of politicians are in that older generation. And so um, right now we're actually organizing 16 digital town halls across the most competitive ridings in Ontario to talk about a just and green future moving forward. We've heard this mentioned by the Minister of Finance that, that recovery will be just and green. So both focusing on jobs and on climate. So we're trying to make sure young people's voices on this, because we're all pretty uh, in favor of that, are heard by politicians and, and older generations. Programs like this are part of that. Hmm. Joel, I want to tap into your um, knowledge of this generation by virtue of the fact that you teach many of them. And uh, I think you're also a parent to some Gen Zs as well. So you've got uh, double the reasons for uh, insight into this next question. Um, the way they have been raised by their parents, uh, is that going to be helpful or harmful to them as they try to win their way through this time? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of hand wringing about helicopter parenting, about bubble wrapping kids, and whether that makes them less resilient in the face of these kind of crises. When we see a young woman like Madeline, of course, there's uh, you know tons of room for for good hope. But this generation is facing something that uh, that has nothing to do with the pandemic, um, which is a, a growing sense of alienation. Right? We have more kids who are on medication who feel uh, that they don't have close friendships, who feel that uh, they, they aren't forming um, close relationships. Uh, that's probably partly due to social media and so on. It doesn't mean all kids are like that, but we do have an epidemic, not just among youth, but among adults too, of a kind of alienation and a search for meaning. And the good news there is that there's a lot of places to get get involved and find meaning, as Madeline pointed out, right? We have at least five major crises going on right now. The pandemic, uh, issues of violence against Black and Indigenous people, climate change, growing economic inequality, and a diminishing of our democratic institutions. Those are five places where there is entry for kids to jump in and, and grab onto something where they can meet with others who think similarly to themselves, make meaning for themselves, and get involved in ways that are meaningful. So you mentioned, Steve, that uh, you know they're going to have to worry about getting jobs and, and so forth, and that is definitely true. But they also, and I think they know this, have to worry about finding work that is meaningful, where they can contribute something to society. And there is a lot of room right now for people to do that. And that's, I think, the hopeful silver lining here. Well, Madeline, clearly you're doing with Future Majority work that is meaningful to you there. But let me ask sort of the more bare bones basic question. Were you able to get a job this past summer? Uh, my, I actually worked at a summer camp, so my job was canceled because hmm. uh, no summer camp. So that was upsetting because I, I love that work. But uh, yeah, everyone's summer has been different. I'm lucky that I've been able to have so much support from my family. I know other kids don't have that situation. Um, but on Joel's point, uh, I think that that idea of social interaction through activism is super crucial. I mean, I joined Future Majority because I was sitting having coffee with a friend and I was new to Trent and I wanted to meet people. And now it's taken over my life in the best possible way. Well, can you still meet people? Yeah, <laughs> still getting to know people and we're still trying to gather more young people around our causes, hmm. which is awesome. Now, is this your last year at Trent? It is my last year, yeah. So what happens next spring? Oh, who knows? Uh, let's see. <laughs> I, I don't know if uh, entering the job market right now is the best thing to do, so I might uh, go to master's work instead. Oh, this is your first degree that you're going for here? Yes. Oh, then for sure do a master's. If you can, why not? Yeah, I'm lucky enough that that's been on the table for me. Yeah, more education is a beautiful thing. Uh, okay, let me read something else here. This is, um, this is from Ipsos. Uh, the research company. Uh, Sheldon, we're on page four here. This is board number two. Projected to be less well off than previous generations, Gen Z knows they'll also be saddled with the responsibility of rehabilitating today's conflict zones and fishing yesterday's plastic bottles out of the oceans for decades. The problems Gen Z have to solve affect the entire world and probably underpin this generation's interest in causes that champion inclusive change that bring the many, not just the few, up with them. 
You know, um, Richard touched on this a little bit earlier of uh, not, not just all of the issues around the pandemic right now, but also climate change, uh, the environmental challenges that we're dealing with right now. Madeline, when you talk to your friends, um, do they talk about do they talk about I want the world to go back the way it was before the pandemic? Um, is, th is that the kind of future they are interested in? I don't think so. Uh, it's uh, it's about building back better. And I know, that, I know that's been said by a lot of politicians, but it's also something that's being echoed by my friends. Uh, there wasn't really a future that was good for young people before the pandemic. Um, we've talked about economic crises, the environmental issues, and racial justice in Canada. That was all a problem before this. And so we're hoping that this is a, a moment where we can really galvanize people around like the opportunity to build back and building back something that's better than it was before. Okay, you must be a Democrat because, you know, building back better is Joe Biden's expression. You didn't just come up with that this second. <laughs> um, we've been using it actually in our digital town hall campaign over the summer. Okay, gotcha. Joel, t tell me about whether or not I mean, Madeline is obviously a, a marvelous representative of her generation. She is passionate about issues, cares about the future, uh, engaged as a citizen. You know, would that all of her generation, would that all of any generation were that way. I wonder if you see them and her generation as being different in any way from the generation that preceded her. That's, it's a great question. And um, one of the things that I think Madeline has had to go through along with her peers, and she's obviously come out in a, in a terrific way, um, but I think it's been be despite rather than because of what we've been doing in schools for the last 25 years. Because schooling, which used to focus on, um, in some ways, at least the ideal of creating democratic and participatory citizens, you know, citizens who can get involved and and uh, do it. Of course, we always wanted kids to be able to get a good job and support their families. But what's happened over the last 25 years is we've narrowed the curriculum in schools um, to focus on standardized testing in math and literacy alone. Other subjects have been pushed to the sidelines, social studies, history, science, arts, theater, uh, you know, sports, extracurriculars. And so what's happened is this kind of myopic focus on just getting a job and, and looking out for yourself. We all know from decades of research that that's not the way we find meaning in the world. Of course, we want to have uh, work where we can support ourselves, but we also need to do things that are, that are meaningful. And what this generation has had to face is a couple of decades of schooling that has pushed that idea out of the mainstream and made it uh, marginal for people like Madeline and and others like her to pick up on them by themselves rather than because schools are introducing them to those possibilities. Richard, you want to follow up on that? I do. Um, the kinds of work that is going to be available to this next generation is going to be very different from their parents' era. In fact, I would go so far as to tell them not to listen to their parents' advice because their parents grew up in a very different world and a very different environment. <laughs> Particularly uh, when you're seeing artificial intelligence, which is really just an umbrella for a wide range of technologies, but when you see AI eating its way up the food chain, essentially eliminating all kinds of routine work, whether it's white collar, you know, legal and accounting, or blue collar, uh, making cars, it doesn't matter anymore. Any work that is routine, anything, any work where you do the same thing more than once, whether it's daily or weekly or annually, is going to be automated. And what that means is that young people are going to have to do work that is constantly creative, constantly innovative. And that's much more taxing. And what it, it does require is that people have a like wellsprings beyond specific, uh, specific, specific studies in STEM, for example. Uh, I've found that in my own career, I've had to draw on art, which I, in which I have virtually no background, and music, and theater, and staging. Uh, and I was a, a math and science nerd, and that's going to be more uh, true in the future than it, than it was for me. So young people have to have a broad education, and they have to plan to be innovative, creative workers, or else they will not be able to find work. Madeline, are you prepared for that future? I mean, I sure hope so. I also think a part of that, though, is uh, challenging our government to support young people, uh, because it's one thing to constantly be innovative, but we know that 
certain people who thrive in this economy aren't necessarily uh, equally, they don't start from the same beginning, right? So we know that economic disparity and, and racial inequality is still alive and alive and well in our country. Uh, and so my generation is hoping to level the playing field a bit by bringing up those issues frequently with government and politicians. Hmm. In, in our last minute here, Madeline, let me give it to you just to talk about, you know, I would completely understand if your generation is kind of both skeptical and disgusted about the future. The world is a pretty messed up place right now. What keeps your, you and your colleagues optimistic? Uh, I think remembering, at least in our country, that we are the largest voting bloc and that we really do have a sense of power, both at the grassroots level and at the more political mainstream level. At least that's the narrative I always try to bring with the people I talk to is, is you have power because you can feel pretty helpless at a time like this when certain. But we do have an impact on how we move forward. And I like reminding myself and other people that the other young people that we matter and our voices matter. They do, but you got to mobilize them. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> that is the challenge. Hey, I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight. That was a splendid discussion. Richard Warzel, Madeline Barbarian, uh, in, in whom I feel very confident about our future, and Joel Westheimer. It's good of all of you to join us here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our Thanks pleasure. for having us, Steve. Yeah. And that is... And that is the agenda for Thursday, September 10th, 2020. Aaron O'Toole won the Conservative Party's top job this summer, making him the new leader of Canada's official opposition. He joins us tomorrow to explain his vision for the party, for the country, and maybe about a fall election. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.